If God is the sum and total of all, how could we possibly ever be separate from it? Now, what you want to define God as, you go ahead and do it. Whatever makes you comfortable. We don't use that, the G word. Okay. Because then we have to go wash our mouth out. Good Buddhist mothers make us wash our <laughs> mouth out. But in Buddhism, this, this notion, this idea of something bigger than ourself becomes, is expressed as the universal Buddha or the cosmic Buddha. And it becomes the Buddha that pervades all things. And now we really get criticized because now we have something that's totally Mahayana. And if you talk to a Theravada in the Southern School, if you talk to them, they're, they're going to go, this is not Buddhism. And it isn't their kind of Buddhism. This is the poetry of the Mahayana. Because the Buddha did teach that everything had the Buddha nature. And he had the Buddha nature. And now we make him really special. But we have to drag along, just like with Jesus. I am the Son and you are too. Okay, Buddhists never got confused. The Buddha said, I am enlightened and you are too. You're not less than me. So we drag this along and we start looking around and we look at all human beings that exist in the world. They all have the Buddha nature. And the only reason they don't express it is because they got confused. They got deluded. And then we get into this business about, well, if we believe in reincarnation, it means all living beings can move towards this life form, us, where we are conscious of ourselves and we can think about something like enlightenment and we can hear the teaching of the Buddha. And then you get eccentric, and Zen masters are famous for being eccentric. They're out there talking to rocks and trees and talking about how they're going to be Buddha someday. And wait a minute. Buddha nature becomes the fabric of the universe. Because Buddha nature is the true self. That's all it is. And our only problem in our existence is we don't know our true self. You know, and we're trained to do it. We're trained to do it so early. Our mother tells us what she wants us to be. Our mother gives us choices. What do you like, chocolate or strawberry? What happens when you say, I like both? Well, a wise mother gives half a scoop of chocolate, half a scoop of strawberry. But a mother that's tired and she's busy and she's got other kids, she says, pick one. There is the beginning of the end. (laughs) And it all happened because of a little dessert. (laughs) And, you know, by the time you're 30 years old, think of all the people that have influenced on who you think you are. You have your parents when you're young, all you want to do is please them. And then when you get to be a teenager, all you want to do is make their life living hell, right? Because now you want to please the kids at school, you know. And we know in education, we know up through about fifth grade, little kids... The one problem we don't have is discipline because they want to please their parents and when they come to school, the, the teachers are surrogate parents and they want to t- please those teachers. In about sixth grade, all this chemical stuff happens in the body and now they want to please somebody else. And all of a sudden they want to please girls or they want to please boys or they want to please their friends and they become little social animals. And so back there with parents and teachers... They're telling them who they are. They're defining them. And then when they get with their friends, they want to be like their friends. So their friends, in a sense, are telling them who they are. If their friends wear their pants down around their knees and walk around with their boxer shorts showing, then that's what they're going to do. You know, it doesn't matter how silly their friends look as long as they can belong to that group of friends. And then they've got another set of teachers that are in a constant tug-of-war with them going, why can't they understand You know, if they just do what I tell them to do, they'd be happy and successful in life. If they'd all go to college, if they'd all do this, they'd all do that. Well, that doesn't go completely unheeded. Because some of those kids are influenced by these teachers, the ones that do go to college, the ones that have these long-range plans. But you know what? The kids that don't have it are still influenced. Because they're now the failures. They're now the ones that the teachers don't approve of and the counselors don't approve of because they told them they weren't going to be successful because they didn't go to college. Because you can't be successful without college. It's a proven fact. Ask any counselor. (laughs) Right? So you get out of high school and you fall in love and maybe you get married 
or you live with a significant other, and now you want to make them happy. So you try to change yourself, although we know beyond a, you know, it's a proven fact that nobody ever changes anybody. You know, the big disappointment of the teenage girl is that Johnny, her high school sweetheart, did not stop being a total jerk when they got married, but she thought she could change him. You know, and so you have the influence of them, and then you go to work, or you go to college. And you get in there and you find out that in order to be whatever it is you've decided to be, whatever it is, if you're framing houses for a living, well, guys that frame houses for a living, they wear certain kinds of baseball caps and they wear certain kinds of belt buckles and they go to certain bars on Friday night and they punch certain guys in the nose. And you're doing all this stuff and you're just trying to fit in and be happy in life. And where are you in all of this? By the time you hit 30, see, most people by the time they hit 30, they have an occupation or a profession. They've started their family. They're done with schooling. And they're the biggest mishmash, this sort of stew, like stone soup, you know the old story? It's like everybody walked by and threw a piece in the pot. And somewhere in all of that is you. But how do you figure out where you're at? You know, what part is posturing? What part is just having an attitude because that's the attitude your friends have and you want to fit in? And we do it. We slide into it. We don't have to think about it. You know, think. Everybody has walked up to a group of friends who are talking about something that they don't completely agree with and maybe said something about it. Like, hey, well, why are you saying that? And then realize that everybody disagrees with them and got quiet and pushed it off to the side and decided... We, we can rationalize it all we want. We say, well, it's not worth the fight. Uh, don't want to offend my friends. Uh, doesn't matter that much. But you know what? Six months later, you're standing there sounding just like them. And maybe the first time that that, whatever that issue was, whether it was a racial issue or it was a political issue or it was an issue that didn't even matter. How about who you think the best baseball team is? Why should your mind change just because you're all friend, all your friends like one team and you like another? Why should it change? But you'll change it to get along with your friends, to fit in. Well, Buddhism has this idea. The Buddha taught this idea that we are a bundle of conditioning. We're a bundle of habits. And that... Well, you, you don't have a clue who the real you is. There's nobody that is alive know who the real you is, and and you don't. So now, how are you going to find the real you? Well, I, as I get older, I see the real me. You think? I think. The only, the only group of people I know that die comfortable are Buddhist. I know that's a very strong statement. But Mother Teresa went out and comforted the dying Hindus in the gutter because they were scared. And Christians are notoriously scared. But you've got to be comfortable with yourself first. And not everybody, I mean, it's a nice idea, it's a bodhisattva ideal, but not everybody's going to know who they are. But there's a, I think there can be a big range in here between having no idea who you are and having some idea who you are and having knowing who you are completely. And that brings us right back to here. <laughs> I knew I was going to get back here somehow.